All right. Another busy, busy day. Busy in a good way, though. I mean, I got a lot of projects going on. Um, recently, I'm, I'm trying to get the Narcan thing going. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the price of my Kindle to a dollar. I'm going to donate every cent of that to the cause. Um, and, you know, I'm going to start doing more stuff with Mickey Avalon, with Sinister, um, doing what we can to raise money for that cause. Um, I think this week I'm going to do the mailing list. So I'll start the mailing list. It's the most efficient way to do it. Um, and then I got all sorts of other creative projects, editing stuff, new stuff I'm doing, screenplay, all sorts of shit. But I'm grateful because I'm doing what I love for a living. And I hope that that encourages other people that may be addicted to drugs or may have been to prison. We've been conditioned just to think that we're straight up pieces of shit. And, you know, when we are using drugs, we are pieces of shit. But, you know, anybody can turn it around. And America loves a comeback story. I love a comeback story. So I try to make my life a living comeback story. And I think that that's a universally respected thing. And, you know, there's a lot. Of, I mean, right now is a hardcore time. But I'm trying to focus on what I do have, what I'm grateful for try to live in gratitude. I try to do nice things for other people. And I feel better about myself. I can look at myself even when I'm not tan. And be like, bomb fool. Bomb. Like, comment, subscribe. Patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. Starting new storylines on there. So there'll be a lot more exclusive story videos on Patreon that will stay there. I've already done interviews with Jeff, um, with Karina got Megan coming up. We got things happening at Patreon. So come on over and let's get right into the story. Um, I don't time these anymore. So I'll just go until I feel that it's been at least 30 minutes or more. I want to make this one short just so that I can get it to you guys. I really like getting my Patreon guys something every single day. And hopefully, you know, the pace will get to a point where everybody's getting something every day. There'll just be multiple storylines going, more guests on, et cetera. Where we left off last time, um, Karina and I were pretty much getting into the homeless life. And I don't remember if I had talked about the fact that my parents had kicked us out. The way that that happened is they'd caught Karina one too many times sneaking into our house. A lot of times we were both naked, you know, and I'd be like, I don't, I don't even know if she was here. She'd just be like, but there'd be like whipped cream, like crusty whipped cream on her tits. I have no idea. I woke up and she was just here like that. She's like, oh my God, you're such a piece of shit. Throw me under the bus. And eventually got to a point where we got in a big argument about it because my dad told me that a reliable source, he didn't cite the source, but he said that a reliable source had told him that my girlfriend, Karina, 108 pounds, had been charged with accessory to murder after the fact. Now, when she was drinking, she was a wreck, straight up train wreck. But one thing that I'll say about her is she's an honest person and she's a loyal person and she was always honest to me. Um, you know, if I asked her something, she'd tell the truth. She's, she's that kind of person, you know? Some people that just deny, deny, deny. That's me. I don't know what you're talking about. N no way. Mm -mm. No, I didn't do that, sir. Sir, we found the, the pound in your trunk. I don't, Dude, it's a fucking rental. And it wouldn't be a rental. You know, shit like that. I just deny, 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 deny. Um, and, you know, as I've explained, I've learned that as I've gotten older. I admitted to having two bags when I was in Florida because I was like, oh, I'm going to sell one so that they can do the other one for free. I thought the old selling weed in high school, you know, uh, excuse would like somehow make the cops be like, okay, you know what, bro? That's completely understandable. No arrest tonight. Just going home. Yeah, right. They gave me possession with intent. And I was looking at fucking prison time in Florida. We're getting into that storyline on Patreon. And then, um, you know, I'd signed a confession when I got busted by the feds so that they would let Jenny go. And then, you know, on the pimping was like the one time that I really tried to like finagle it out of them by giving them a bullshit story, but it didn't work. So like, get somebody on the phone or not, I couldn't do it. Put me in jail. So I ended up going to jail anyway. Didn't work. Um, 
Karina's the kind of person that's just, you know, just honest. She'll just admit to shit if people ask her because that's what kind of person she is. And, you know, so every time my parents would catch us, they'd be like, what is going on? Karina would be like, um, I broke in last night. We stole two bottles of Merlot and then we did anal. So what? My parents would be like, and like just boot us out. A couple times they booted us out and we like ran out of the house with the comforter and we just like went and slept at a park. My parents live in like a nice neighborhood. Can't even imagine what my neighbors thought at that period. We were just so belligerent. We get in these crazy drunken fights, screaming at each other. Then they'd see us like walking down the block, just like with a comforter around each other. And they must have, well, I think they all know that, no, yeah, that's the Leone boy. That dude's a hype. Like, who knows what they say? But I'm sure, like, whatever they say behind my back is pretty bad. So what was, like, the straw that broke the camel's back with my parents and, um, you know, me getting kicked out of their house, like, permanently, where I was, like, literally homeless for most of that summer. Because, like, now we're in June. It's just about to be July. And, you know, my dad told me about the the you know, accessory to murder after the fact. He's like, Ryan, she could kill you. Have you ever heard of Susan Atkins? I'm like the Manson girl? Exactly. Oh, are you... <laughs> and I could quote that. Are you suggesting that Karina is part of the Manson family? I didn't say that, but I was like, Susan Atkins, what the fuck? What are you trying to say? She's not like that. She's a fucking drunk. She got a few DUIs. She's never been arrested for accessory to murder after the fact. And I asked her and she'd been like, what the fuck? No, no validity in that whatsoever. Not even, not even loosely based on anything. It's just a complete made up thing. We we're like, where did that come from? And my dad went crack. My dad's solid like that. He's like, nope, I'm not giving my source up. I'm like, well, then it's not true. You know, I mean, I could say anything that somebody said. I mean, if there's nothing to back it up, how the fuck is it true? And he'd be like, well, your mother and I, we just don't feel comfortable with a murderer being naked in our home. I was like, listen, if you're going to have a murderer in your home, naked's probably the best. I would say that a murderer is probably least threatening, nude. And my parents ended up getting a restraining order on her. And she was staying at her parents' house. So she had been fired at this point. And she was staying at her parents' house. And a sheriff came and served her a restraining order. My parents actually went and filed one because they were convinced that she was like some new age Manson chick. You know, it was fucking weird. Because, you know, like, like 108 pounds, completely non-threatening, just an alcoholic. Um, a sexy one, but nobody to be scared of. Nobody to get a restraining order. It's like... I've dated some psychopaths. I'm surprised they never got restraining orders on that, those girls, but there weren't those allegations. And he wouldn't tell me. And I would guess, I had no idea. I didn't even know where to begin. Like, who, who does my dad talk to that even knew her? But he's like, he'd always be like, it's a very reliable source. And she called me and she's like, oh my God, your parents actually filed us. What the fuck? And I think we ended the last video talking about how, you know, I'd gone down to LA, gone down to Hollywood to go see Santos, the guy that I was doing the film deal with spun guy. And on the way there, I got that Facebook message, keep your bitch on a leash, you know, basically saying that Karina was reaching out to her ex and her ex boyfriend's new girlfriend intercepted it. And let me know, you know, like keep her on a leash. She's like telling him that you're lame. I was like, spot on. And then she doesn't love you. And she's just having fun. It was like in quotation marks. I was just like sinking in my chair. And I told you in the last video, I was like, hey, honey, can I see your phone? She's like, okay. And I grabbed it, rolled my window down, super psychotically, slow, no emotion, stoic. And just throw it out the window, shatters on the road. And she's like, oh my God, why would you do that? And I was like, why would you cheat on me? And I pulled over. And I remember going to a liquor store and buying a pint of Jack Daniel. And we're both strung out on alcohol. 
and I would always split whatever I got with her. But I like grabbed it and just like out of spite, I like just start pounding it right in front of her. And she's just like, oh my God, I just get wasted and I just tell him. Like she admitted it right away. She's like, I just fucking call him and uh, text him. And I was, you know, I was hurt. It's probably in tears. You know, I'm probably giving you like the tough, like, yeah, I just rolled the window and I was like, bitches ain't shit. Yeah, right, dude. I was like, oh, why would you do that? I thought we were dumb, drunk sluts. Because that was like our inside joke, which, I mean, sounds ridiculous when you're emotional. I thought you were my dumb, drunk slut. She's like, I am your dumb, drunk slut. I love you. I'm just like, oh, this is what happens when two addicts or alcoholics get together. A very unhealthy, toxic, codependent relationship. I don't really remember what happened that day, but eventually we had gone to Santo's house and I think it was her first time meeting him and I was just treating her badly. You know, Santos is like, Hey, who's this? This is your, this is your lady. Hi, I'm, I'm Santos. I was like, yeah, that's the slut. And he's just like looking at me. He probably talked to his wife and he was like, huh, so that's how it works in that family. Mm, good to know what kind of guy Ryan is. Now he already knew he was with me through the tail end of my disaster of a marriage i'd always call him you know at like three in the morning i have nowhere to go he's such a slut and she thinks i'm such a drug addict when you let me come over so he was used to my drama who isn't you know i'm not the kind of guy that's like like listen if you talk to anyone that knows me in real life there's not going to be one person that you will that you will find anywhere in the universe that's like oh ryan leone Oh, no, 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 he always says it's Leone. Oh, yeah, yeah, Leone. <laughs> that fool's drama. Yeah. No one will say I'm cool, calm, and collected because I'm not. I'm some neurotic, hypochondriac drama person. I thrive off theatricality and attention. It sucks, but at least I can admit it. I have pathological narcissism, but I think I'm perhaps a functional sociopath. I mean... I do nice things for people. And that's what I'm finding is I get sober as I've been sober when I was sober for three years. The more that I help other people, the less of a piece of shit I feel and the less narcissistic and the less self-centered I become. Um, and, and that's just it. I mean, this time I'm taking extends. So personality is not the only thing that's bomb, if you know what I'm talking about. So we were like in a tumultuous relationship at this point, obviously. She had gotten fired. We got in that fight. We made up because that's just how we are. You know, we'd be like screaming at each other and then I'd like throw her against the wall and we'd I'd, like pull her hair and we'd have like some like straight racy, like, you know, um, red shoe diary sex scene, like at some park because we didn't have a house. And we'd make up because we did love each other. I don't know if we were in love with each other, but we had feelings for each other. That's for sure. Feelings enough where we both got really jealous about stuff. So what happened after that? So yeah, we were squatting in abandoned houses and you know, that was like a pretty good little scheme that we had. Um, but we were running out of money. So like we, or, well, we didn't really have any money. We had like my royalties, but at that point, I don't know. I think it had dwindled down to like, maybe at this point, like maybe it was like three or 400, like maybe in the beginning. Then it went down to like 200. And it went down to like a hundred. So we'd get like, we'd be like, okay, we can get a hotel room for a night or we can get alcohol for three days. And we'd always go with the alcohol. Oh, and tobacco. And then we'd always fight about this. Like, oh my God, you have to get your stupid fucking Newports. Let's just spend it on bourbon or, I don't know, what is she? Some fucking, let's spend it on gin. Gin? What the fuck? It's like some old. <laughs> Let's go in on some prunes too. Let's get a donut seat. That's like gin. Who the fuck drinks that? It's some retirement home drink. She'd always get mad that I smoked. And so it was obvious that we needed money. We did steal here and there. We applied for food stamps. Um, or no, she did. I couldn't get it because I'm a convicted drug dealer. But a convicted pedophile can get food stamps. <laughs> What universe do we live in, man? How can a pedophile go get fucking food stamps? And I, no, <sighs> drug dealer? No way. Uh-uh, uh-uh. No, bro. You sold drugs. 
we'll let dude that, you know, mowed down a fucking kid stay at an apartment complex where there's a bunch of other kids, but, or where there's a, you know, we'll, yeah, we'll let the pedophile stay with in a, a complex with a bunch of kids, but we won't let you get welfare. That's another thing. They can preclude you for being a drug dealer at apartment complexes, but for some reason, like, I don't think sex offenders are under the same thing. Like, they're protected. It's the weirdest sh- I've never understood that about them. Um, but I couldn't get welfare. And I remember I was just like, you know, I was talking to the welfare lady. And I was like, she's like, have you ever been convicted of a felony? I was like, who wants to know? And she's like, well, have you? And I said, is that going to affect my eligibility? She's like, probably not, unless you're a drug dealer. And I'm just like, it's like, what if I lie? She's like, well, for a fraud, I'm like, fuck. I was like, let me ask you something. Can pedophiles get it? And she's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, the fuck? And so Karina ended up getting it. She has a few DUIs. Those are cool, but drug dealing, not cool. So we kind of like lived off that. And she introduced me to Two Buck Chuck, which is like $2 wine at um, Trader Joe's. I was never a wine guy you know, and we've talked about this before. I was a straight up IV drug user. I missed the whole bar nightclub, you know, going home with someone and then waking up embarrassed that you're fucking them. I missed that whole thing. I was the kind of guy that just smoked crack in motel rooms with like hood rats. And I was like, I'm a player. (laughs) Dope. This is dope for sure. With like my acne, Ugh. thinking I was cool, you know. And it's funny when you're on drugs, like you look in the mirror and you're all, you look like some like you know, sucked up scarecrow, and you just you you honestly think you look. You're like, damn, I look pretty bad right now, in a good way. And that's just like the delusion you get when you're on drugs. So anyway, you know we couldn't really do much. We panhandled, we squatted in abandoned houses. Uh, once in a while I'd come up on money, a variety of scams that I had at that time in my life and came to a point where I needed a job. You know, it's like, I was like, honey, I'm going to get a job. And she's like, okay, I supported you like the first month of our relationship. I think that's a great idea. Of course, the only thing I can do is telemarket. So I think I went on Facebook. I was like, hey, um, does anyone know any telemarketing jobs in Santa Barbara? And one of my friends I've known for a long time was like, hey, I'm managing one. Um, I forget what the pay was, but it wasn't bad. And it was like pretty good if you got the commissions. And what were we doing? It was some straight scam. Uh, Most of these telemarketing places essentially broker services that are otherwise free, but you just kind of like, you know, target people. And this was inbound telemarketing. So they'd like put an ad in like a housing section or like on Craigslist for people looking for new places. And I think the whole pitch with that was we would give them a list of foreclosed houses that were cheaper to rent or something. I don't, it didn't even make sense. I was like, yeah, but I picked it up quick. I'm like, yes, if you give me 80 bucks right now, give me your credit card, complete stranger that you're calling because you got this off Craigslist. I'll give you a list of houses that were recently foreclosed and you can rent a room for next to nothing. I just need 80 bucks right now. Okay. Is it a visa or a MasterCard? And I was just, you know, I was good at it. I got good pretty quickly. So I started making like, okay money there. Um, I think like my first day I made like five or six sales or whatever. And uh, that was like unheard of at this place, but I've been telemarketing like my whole, pretty much that's like the only kind of employment I ever had done besides moving furniture and I washed dishes for one day when I lived in Florida and I got fired. That is such a bad job. And so basically like telemarketing was my trade. I mean, besides writing, telemarketing is like my other thing. So they were like really happy to have me. And I think that maybe they started giving me cash advances. I want to say it was, it was a long time ago and I was drinking a lot. So it's very spotty, but I was doing well there and I think they started giving me money daily because I think I explained my situation or something and they were giving me money. Whatever the case, we started having money again while I was working. Everything was going well. I worked there for like probably about eight or nine days, which, you know, you guys know how it is. In junkie years, eight or nine days is like seven months. Like crazy shit happens in that amount of time when you're a drug addict or alcoholic. Well, crazy things can happen. And 
I remember like I'd made it a success, a successful week and I go to the bathroom one day and I smell heroin. It's unmistakable. It's heroin, burnt heroin at that. It smells like, um, my friend Tony O'Neill, who wrote the book Six City, he says that heroin always reminds him of like candles burning at church, which I think is very accurate. It's like, you know, it's that smell of a candle that's been blown out at like a church. It's what, I, I don't know, you just recognize the smell if you're a junkie. And, you know, my junk dart is, I was like, oh my God, I smell heroin. And then, you know, it, it's true. It's like possesses you. We've talked about it. And like, that's it. Cannot think of anything but heroin. I like walk in to the telemarketing room and I go right up to my manager and I was like, I smell heroin. And he's like, whoa, man. Hey, do you want to hit or something? And I was like, I was like, hey, uh, I don't, um, I don't smoke it because I'm not a bitch. But if you can give me a little piece, I'll shoot it. He was like, uh, and I was on Suboxone. Remember, I'm slamming Suboxone. But I always will like relapse, even though I'm on Suboxone and kind of feel it, like not get a rush, but like feel it enough where you're just in a bad mood. You're itchy and in a bad mood. None of the euphoric effects. You're just like, Ugh. and then, you know, by the next day you can do it and actually feel it. And I'm a light switch heroin addict. I do it once. There's no fucking way I'm stopping unless I go to jail, rehab, or prison. That's it. I, I'm, I've never been a weekend warrior. I've tried. And I know we've talked about that a long, a lot, you know, a lot of times. And most heroin addicts have the same kind of, uh, you know, total bullshit plan. Like, all right, Friday, I'm doing it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to nod out. It's going to be blissful like it was when I was 19. No consequences. Fuck my parole. I'll just go into, you know, opiate dreamland, just be blissfully, you know, in this limbo between being asleep and being awake, feel nothing. That's the delusion. You get that euphoric recall. That's what it's going to be like day one. Now, typically on day one, you do get some euphoria. You nod out, usually burn a pinhole in your pants. And then, and we've talked about this as well, the possession starts. It's a, it, it, it is not in a literal sense, but a figurative demon possesses you and it wants you to do it again. So it will make you induce physical pain on yourself, whether that be like stretching in weird ways so that like when you're done, you feel all fucked up, like you got in a car accident. For me, it is invariably me taking my shoes off, taking my socks off, no matter where I am, it doesn't matter where I am. I can be at a bar on a bar stool and I'll take my shoe off. It usually stinks too. I've, I've had like, I have a mutated strain of athlete's foot from like all the different prisons and rehabs and shit that I've been in that have like communal showers. I'll take the sock off and I'll just start scratching until I bleed. But it's not just like normal athlete's feet scratching. It's like I'm ripping out chunks of flesh and like blood droplets are literally like spewing out of my foot it's it's gory and it's ridiculous and it feels amazing it almost feels like scratching a mosquito bite you know slightly orgasmic it does or sneezing both of those are or coming <laughs> that's the the ultimate orgasmic feeling right that's what scratching your disgusting, junky athlete's feet feels like when you're on heroin. It feels great. You bleed. Then you put your sock back on, and it feels a little bit uncomfortable because all the blood starts seeping into the sock. And then it gets stuck there like it's like paper mache or something. And when you try to take the sock off again, it like more of your flesh is ripped off. Now you have open wounds on your foot. So your plan of, I'm just going to do it one day, the next morning you're like, fuck, my foot hurts. You can't even walk. You're limping. You know, your friends are like, damn fool. Did you get butt fuck last night? And you're just like, no, I just did heroin. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, man. They like hug you. It's so sad. You relapsed, you know? I mean, if you're like 
a career heroin addict. Every time you relapse, it's like some, you know, it's like a tragedy that everyone knows about. Especially now with like social media, you'll get like messages from people you haven't talked to. Oh man, I heard you relapse. What the fuck? I did that yesterday. How do people know about this already? Because you're obvious, you know, and then people talk. Day two, same delusion again. (sighs) All right. Day two is just going to be a soft landing from day one. It's not going to be as euphoric. It's not going to be as blissful. But at least your feet aren't going to hurt or whatever it is. I mean, like, you know, Jeff, he stretches and his back gets fucked up. Or, you know, he gets like the dinosaur back. It's like, uh, and then he has to like numb himself. That's the possession part of it. And it's always the junkie delusion. Two days, two days in a row and then we're good. Then day three, you're fucked. You're physically dependent. You're, you're done. Yeah. That's it. I'm saying the story. No, that's not the end of the story. But, um, and that's always how it happens, you know, for me. So I, this guy gives me heroin, my manager. He's like, yeah, I'm your real friend. Here's heroin. I'm like, all right, cool. Go into the um, bathroom and I do it. Like I said, I don't really feel it, but I feel grouchy and, and I'm itchy. Karina is oblivious to it. She hadn't been around me as a heroin addict at this point. She just, knew that I did it, but I don't think she really cared, you know, I'd like be telling her, I'd be like, yeah, I've been a heroin addict for like 16 years, I've been to like 25 rehabs, I've been to prison twice, she's like, I don't care, let's go to a bar, your life's fucking depressing, let's go drink, I'm like, no, all right, I'm glad you like my stories, and then we just go get drunk, so I started getting strung out while I'm working at this telemarketing place, unbeknownst to her. I'm not living with my parents anymore. So I have like really no one to hold me accountable. And yes, they were giving me money that my second week. That's right. I gave them like a solid week of performance. Second week is when I actually like had money. So I could afford a heroin habit. I mean, they were only giving me like 60 bucks a day or something. It wasn't like a lot of money, but I could afford to chip away at a little heroin habit, drink, tobacco, but we still didn't have anywhere to live. And, you know, at this point, she would sneak me into her parents' house. And they were like, you know, um, Hispanic, very nice people. Mom um, doesn't speak like fluent English. Dad and I are are tight. It's cool. Mom's very sweet as well. But they started catching me at their house. And I'd be like, you know, be like naked except for a beanie. You know, I'd have like a billabong beanie. And I'd just go like walk out her room and like go take a piss just wearing my beanie leave the door open, piss on the seat. And they just kind of walk by and give me a bad look. And they were always very polite, but then Karina would be like, oh my God, my parents saw you pissing naked with a beanie on. You gotta go. I'm like, fuck. And then, so sometimes I go sleep in her best friend's car, you know, cause she lived with her mom and I wasn't allowed in her house cause <laughs> I'm a convict. I'm a junkie, you know, all that. Everyone talks. <sighs> I heard he has hep C too. What a piece of shit. Don't bring him in our house. So basically, I had nowhere to go. Now, Jeff, he let me stay at his place, but the gay psychic was there. And, you know, I a lot of it was I just didn't really like him telling me that, you know, the fucking moon was in the, the correct retro cycle, so I wasn't going to prison. Even though I'd be talking to my attorney and I'd be like, how's it looking? He's like, you're definitely going to prison. I'm like, hey, you told me we could beat it if I paid you the seven grand. He's like, I didn't know that you actually did it. I was like, I fucking told you that on the phone. I told you I didn't do it. It's supervising a process. It's a misdemeanor, bro. I figured this out on Google. He's like, yeah. Yeah. Send me the link. I'm like, what the fuck? I just started being a bad attorney. And so then I go over to Jeff's house because he let, you know, he let on the weekends. It was cool. Weekdays, I'd call. And I was, you know, I'm a procrastinator. I've always been that way. Like, if I want to borrow money from someone, I'll, like I'll, I'll be like, all right, I'm going to call him. I'm just going to ask him. I'll like practice in front of the mirror. I'm like, hey, can I have 15 bucks? I promise I'll pay you back. Oh, really? Hey, thanks, man. You're a really good friend. Then I'll get on the phone and we'll talk for like, you know, hour, two hours. Because once the way I am on video is the way I am in person. I just don't shut the fuck up. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then like Sinister came over and gave me paintings. And then, oh, would you, Mickey Avalon came over. Isn't that fucking crazy? Mickey's the shit. And like, it's high energy. Sometimes people just like can't handle me for too long. You know, on here, you can just press stop. Like, ooh, this dude's fucking annoying me. Stop. Oh, hold on. Let me thumbs down that. (laughs) Bitch. 
but in real life, you can't do that. So my energy is kind of intense and Jeff loves me. He's my best friend, but we've lived together multiple times and I can be a, a bit much. And then there was also the, the gay psychic who would just be like, oh my God, I talked to a dolphin this weekend. He said that instead of going to prison, you're going to Paris, homeboy. And I'd be like, spot on. Really accurate, George. Thanks, man. This dude's talented. Jeff, he's amazing. Everything you told me. But he started getting mad that I was staying there, you know? And, you know, Jeff had taken up a new hobby of, of growing weed. And Jeff's like one of those highly obsessive people. I'm the same way. We hyper-focus on something if it interests us. So right now, art is like my new obsession, my new little hyper-focus. And I'm learning all these different techniques and it's fun. I get really into it. I go all in or if like I'm interested in a topic, I read everything I can about it. You know, if I'm interested in a genre of porn, I beat off to every video and every picture I can find on the internet. Even if I'm not on meth, just on the cuff, you know? And so he's growing like, he took his weed growing seriously. I mean, it was like, you know, really good weed. And, you know, he had like one of those, um, I don't know, like one of those big, tents you know where you put your mother plants and then he had the whole thing the electric ballast on the s hooks all that stuff and he'd come over and he was like really like he's like look he's a little new age i'm putting tender love into this mm. you know he went on some like psychedelic renaissance with acid which i support um it actually took me out of my three years of sobriety but <laughs> with that being said he, he did take a lot of insights out of it so that was his trip he was growing high quality weed George was there giving these bullshit, you know, psychic readings, you know, you know, oh, and he had like this really annoying dog and it wasn't the best place to be. And I could tell that I wasn't really welcome there because George didn't like me, but you know, Jeff, like over, you know, it was the weekend. He'd be like, I don't give a fuck. It's my best friend. He's going to stay here. And I'd be like, but he stinks. He never showers. That's not his fault. He's homeless. Your best friend is homeless. He's like, mm, he's not always homeless. He just goes through periods. It's like, it's true. Not always homeless always figure out a way to get my own place. So it was kind of uncomfortable. And, you know, Kendra, I could sleep in her car here and there. Sometimes it'd be raining. She'd bring me out like a pop tart in the middle of the night and just kind of give it to me. I'd smoke a bowl and just be like shivering in the back of the car, like nibbling on the pop tart. My life sucks. And I wouldn't make Karina come sleep with me in the back of this car. It was just too uncomfortable. She's a trooper and she did do it quite a few times. I got to a point where I was like, eh. If it comes down to the car, I'll just, I'll just fucking go. It's all right. And there were plenty of nights where I didn't even have the car. I didn't have Jeff's. I had nowhere to go. I literally like would go to parks and pass out under the park bench with no hoodie, no nothing. I would just, you know, pull the old, like, well, like you know, like little kids do. And they like make the little like tent thing. You know, you, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> shh, freak me out. <sighs> It was scary. Do a little tent thing and uh, hey, shh. That like echoed in me. That was really loud. I wonder if it's going to sound like that when you listen to this. Um, shh. Our landlord's dog, who I've told you guys before, we just bring in because we don't think they should have to sleep outside. It's raining right now in LA. Like they shouldn't have to sleep outside, but they bark a lot. And that's why I really don't do videos outside too much either because they would like outside, they bark way worse and it would just ruin videos. I'd be like 40 minutes into it and it would just ruin the video. Um, but, uh, you know, and there were like several nights where, like I said, like I would sleep outside. Now I'm getting addicted to heroin and, uh, you know, it, it was pretty much like every night I, I had to figure out where I was going to stay. I had this red backpack that I was living out of. Now, Karina started getting suspicious when, you know, I'd get off work and then my only connection at that point for some reason, I think it's just because I've been out of the loop for so long, was my manager at the telemarketing place. And, you know, he had to get it from someone. So it was like, you know, even more watered down than just a direct dealer. Like that guy would give him the runaround and then he would give me like a way sketchier runaround. But yeah, he said 30 minutes. I'm like, all right, cool. Four or five hours could go by. You know the drill. Karina will be like, what's going on? Are you cheating on me? And I'm like, no. Nope. I, um, and I, I, you know, I'd come up with something. Yeah, no, 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 no. We're just, uh, we're playing darts. Where are you at a bar? 
No. Playing darts at work. I have a dartboard here, duh. Ah, okay. So it'd be shit like that. But she started getting suspicious. Eventually, she caught me shooting up black tar. Big black shot. It was probably like a week into my habit. And her alcoholism, I mean, she had been fired. She was like, when I first met her, she was drinking hard, but she wasn't drunk all the time, you know? Like not pissed, not like stumbling drunk. She met me, it slowly started being that way. And when she got fired, she had no reason to like, you know, have to be presentable or have to manage her life. So she was just belligerently drunk all the time. And I was pretty much like that too, except I'm not as, I don't show it as much. You know, I don't like waver and slur like, you know, she's, she's much more obvious. But when I start doing mixing heroin with it, then I start slurring a lot. And she saw me shooting up this shot and it was like dark shot. She's like, wait a second. Why is that dark? what are you doing? I was like, well, honey, I ran out of Suboxone and I had to save up all the cottons. And this is just a cotton rinse. It's just a bunch of cottons because it has the Suboxone stuff on it. She's like, it's fucking black. Cottons aren't black. And I'm just like, just leave me alone. I kept doing it. Eventually she's like, wait a second. I Googled it. All the signs, acne, you have a small dick. I was like, I was born that way. She's like, yeah, but acne. You're always going to sleep. I remember that's really how she found out is because after I'd done that shot in front of her, we went to fuck and, and I couldn't get it up, you know? And like either on heroin, I can get it up and then I can't come, which is like, mm, you know, it's like drinking decaf coffee or something. I mean, you know, what's the point? You can't come. It's kind of like, mm. I guess to please her, but you just, it, it stops being pleasurable. And if you don't have lube, it just gets like, it gets painful. It feels sunburn or something. And then there's the polar opposite of that where you just can't get it up. And that was this particular night after she had seen me shoot up the black stuff. And she's like, what the fuck? And she's like playing with, you know, she's you know, playing with it. And she's like, what's wrong with it? And I'm just like, I don't know. And I just, I'm like, I'm on heroin. And she's like, what? You are such a drug addict. That sucks. And she was like pretty cool about it. She wasn't like freaking out. But so her alcoholism is getting bad. My heroin addiction is getting bad. And she starts blacking out drunk. Like, you know, we get in fights. And then she'd like, I'm going back to my parents' house. You sleep at the park, you homeless piece of shit with your red backpack. I'd look at my red backpack. It was like my only friend at that. It was like Wilson. I was my only friend, this inanimate object. It just went everywhere with me. And I'd have like my Suboxone and like, like all these like old rigs and shit in there and a pair of boxers. That was pretty much my life. Those are like the essentials. And she's like, I'm going to my parents' house. And she just like fucking face plant into like a patch of ivy in front of their place. I'm just like, oh my God. Try to get, I'd be like, baby, get up. And she's get off of me. You're a fucking drug addict and I don't want to be with you anymore. I want a new boyfriend that's got a bigger dick. And then she'd just go to her parents' house and leave me like outside by myself. I'd be like, fuck. The park again? You know, I started like being friends with all like the hobos around town. Smoke like, you'd like be like smoking meth and shit at these parks. They'd be like, hey, yo, uh, you want to hit this shit? And I was like, nah. I'm just going to sleep under this bench without a hoodie. I never did get a hoodie. And, you know, everyone kind of started knowing me, you know, and it sucked, you know. I started learning, like, you know, I'd already been homeless, but, like, now I was, like, in a whole new generation of homeless people. I was, like, older, so it was, like, creepy, you know. Like, I'd sometimes Karina would kick me out, and I'd have to go sleep at the park, wake up. And this is a park right next to one of the public high schools in Santa Barbara. And I'd wake up. And like, there'd be kids there smoking pot, like out of an apple. And they just kind of look at me and, you know, I mean, I think I was starting to look older. I just look like that creepy dude that is sleeping at the park. You know the type. I'd be like, hey, you guys want to see my fear and loathing tattoo? I'll show you if you give me a hit of that pot. 
And they would just be like, um, ew, look at that old man. That's how Karina talks. That's the kind of shit that I was dealing with at that time. And her alcoholism got to a point where, you know, like once in a while, I'd go to her parents' house and, you know, they had a pool outside. We'd go sleep near the pool and then her dad would catch us. And he's just such a sweet guy that he'd buy us a hotel room. And we'd be in the hotel room and she'd be so drunk, she'd like get a bottle of wine and just like smash the window out or the mirror out. And, you know, like the cops would come like to the point where we both had to leave this hotel room that, you know, um, her dad had paid for. And then we just like deny it. We'd be like, oh my God, no, we left the hotel room to go bowling. No idea how this happened. We weren't even in there. Play the tapes back. That's all I got to say about that. And of course they never would, you know, and her dad would like get billed and, you know, Karina would be like, I'll pay you back someday. And it was just, it was getting ridiculous. I don't really remember what it was that had kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back, but, you know, I think maybe her blackouts, her trashing one too many hotel rooms, something got to a point where we needed treatment. It was like, all right. I'm bad on heroin. She's bad on alcohol. And I'm drinking on top of it. My alcoholism did not, you know, it didn't, it didn't waver. You know, I was still just as drinking as much as her, but now I'm shooting heroin on top of it, which is incredibly dangerous. So I told my dad that I was strung out. I'm like, dad, I'm strung out. He's like, how long? I'm like, "Uh, like two weeks. He's like, oh, all right. All right. Detox will still work. You know, because he knew like if I'd been strung out for too long, then um, I wouldn't even, I would never stay at a detox. You know, it's happened to me so many times. I've strung out for like three or four months, try to go to a detox and I last like a day or two. I'm just like, fuck this, going to go get loaded. Sometimes I stay, sometimes I don't. But it was so, the the period that I was using was so short that, um, you know, he was optimistic that I'd, I'd be able to go to detox and get better. My dad was always really optimistic. I think he always knew deep down that, that I was going to be okay. Eventually I was going to turn out to be like a good guy because I, you know, when I'm sober. I'm a really good guy. Problem is I'm never sober. So I'm never a good guy, but he saw glimpses when I was sober for three years, our relationship was much better. So then I got her dad on board and I basically told him that, you know, she was out of control. She needed rehab and her dad was like okay how much i was like i don't know i called that place that i've been to in orange county and um you know explain the situation i was like you know and at this point where you guys are probably like well what what happened with the birth control i bet you were still fucking her you piece of shit i was but i was pulling out ancient asian method that probably doesn't work uh, you know but it you know it Feels like you're doing something when it goes everywhere. Oh, yeah. There's no way you're pregnant after all that shit came out. We're good. Pretty stupid, but that's pretty much how we were back then. So I call the place in Orange County, I explain the situation. I say that, you know, I have my girlfriend. We want to come down and they do the intake and they gave us a reduced rate. You know, I think we had to each come up with like $1,000 to get in. I think my insurance covered it, but she, hers didn't, something like that. And my parents let me use their car to drive down there. She had gotten like a, uh, like a gallon of vodka. So we started drinking really heavily. And she agreed to go to rehab. I mean, she knew she was fucked up. She'd been sober before and she'd been through treatment. And, and now Karina, unlike me, she really is like a really great person sober. And it's night and day with her. I mean, I am too, but it takes me a while to like, you know, recover and then like be a good person her it's 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 uh dr jekyll and miss hyde straight up she's a completely different psychopath when she's on alcohol but i get her to go and my parents lend me their car and we drive down to orange county from santa barbara which is like mm, like two two and a half hours you know it's probably like an hour outside of la la is an hour and a half from santa barbara so we go to santa barbara or we go to la and she's drinking and she's drinking with a purpose. You know, she's guzzling vodka, burping. And she's just getting mean and drunk. She's like, you. 
are a bitch ass white boy. I'm just saying, hmm. And then I would say stuff that I don't really want to say here because I'll be judged. But I was not the nicest. It was not just her. We were saying nasty stuff back and forth. She was getting increasingly more drunk. And, you know, I was like, honey, I'm going to have to go get heroin down to NLA. And she's like, what? Fuck that. No, no, no. I'm like, what? That's bullshit. You're drinking vodka. You know I'm strung out. Let me go get high one last time. What the fuck? You of any, of all people should understand that. And she's like, no. Man, she made a big deal about it. But she ends up passing out. And like now it's it's nighttime. And I drive down to LA. I think I drove to, mm, I don't know, like Town Street, I want to say. Yeah, Town Street. And I parked on town. You know, I had my mom's SUV, BMW SUV. And uh, I parked it you know, in this curb. Now, for those of you that um, don't live in Los Angeles, I'm sure you're aware of what Skid Row is. If you haven't seen it, um, YouTube, downtown LA Skid Row, and you get a sense of what this area looks like. It's it's very dilapidated. It's got tent cities, tents everywhere, Um, you know, crackheads and people selling meth and heroin and not too violent in the day. Nighttime is a whole different beast. Um, and it's really bad down there. We have 60,000 homeless people in LA County. Um, and downtown is just like a huge tent commune, pretty much. So she's passed out, you know, um, in the car. So like my whole plan is like, all right, I'll just leave her passed out in the car. And I'll go score. No problem there. <laughs> Not like one of these psychopaths can just break the the window to the probably the nicest car that's ever been parked right there. You know, it's like, this is like a really bad area. Uh, Well, you know, people go down there and score drugs. So nice cars go down there all the time. And so I'm parked at the curb and I'm just getting out of the car. I'm trying to be quiet because she's sleeping and she wakes up and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm just like, um, I love you. And I just yank the key and I, you know, press the button and lock it. And like with that car, like, of course she can open it if she wants to, but the alarm's on a, so it'll make a huge scene. And she's like in the middle of downtown LA at night. And I don't think she'd ever been down there. And it's scary. See all sorts of crazy shit down there. You know, people like going by with like these crazy shopping carts and they have all this, they have like cans and like a random Armani suit. Uh, They're, I don't know in case they get invited to the crackhead ball or something. I don't know why somebody would have shit like that. Oh, oh, ooh, ooh, 11 p.m. Crackhead ball tonight, everyone. Let's go. Yeah, that doesn't happen. But they have shit like that. Or like a random, like, you know, Mac computer screen from like the 90s. What the fuck? Why, Why does that guy have that? You see stuff like that. And then you see just really kind of sketchy people. So I lock her in there. She's like, what are you doing? And she's like hitting the window. It was like, it reminded me of something like in a Chucky movie, you know? Like, and she's like, what are you doing? And she's hitting everything. And I'm just like, I gotta go. I love you. And I just, just like disappear into the darkness. Now it didn't take me too long to score. Probably left her there for like five minutes. Probably felt like a lot longer to her. I'm sure if she told me this story, she'd tell it a lot different than the way I'm telling it. But I come back. After I score, I got like a football for 20 bucks, which is like a 0.2 of black tar. And I get back in there and she's just petrified, shaking in fear. And she's like, why would you do this to me? It's so fucked up. I'm like, what happened? She's like, some black guy licked the window. And I was like, shut up. That is so scary. That did not happen. She's like, why would I lie? There's like some fucking snail saliva trail. I'm like, holy shit. And uh, she was very upset about that. We will get into our adventures in rehab together and everything that happened after all this. I'm going to start having my mental breakdown. And then we get into the third um, prison term, which is a pretty interesting time. Thank you guys for checking out the video. Please like, comment, subscribe. Check out Patreon, patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. Stay safe. Um, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Palabra.